Hello guys, welcome to H2O, the A to Z of chemistry. I'm Dr. Ritu Johar, your educator for this course on hydrogen and I hope you are enjoying this course with me. So today we begin with lecture 8 from the course, but make sure you watch the previous ones before viewing this one. Now till now in this lecture we have had a detailed discussion on hydrogen and then we in the last lecture started the discussion on the compounds of hydrogen where we started our discussion on the hydrides. So what are hydrides? They are the binary compounds of hydrogen which means that they are going to be two element compounds out of which one is going to be hydrogen and the other can be some other element. Now I hope the whole discussion that was clear to you and uh, you do not have any doubts related to it but in case you have please feel free put them in the comment section or you can even email them to us but do not keep your doubts to yourself now one question i ask you all and that question is which is the most important hydride for all of us well i hope you all know the answer to it because this is not a live class so i'll have to tell the answer but i'm very sure that you all know the answer and the answer is water right so water is h2o a binary compound of hydrogen with oxygen as the element so this is going to be a molecular hydride this is going to be an electron rich hydride as far as what we have learned in the last lecture and water h2o this is something that is so special to me first of all it is so special to me because the name of my channel is h2o chemistry so that is uh, why it is so special to me but apart from that speciality well i hope you all remember the formula from when you started learning chemistry in probably class 7th and even your parents who may not be knowing even chemistry they also know the formula of water that is h2o why is it so well this is because water is the precious gift given to us by nature life on earth is possible only because of water and we all understand the importance of water in our life and we cannot imagine life without water so today as science students let us understand what water makes uh, why what are the things that make water so special for us here in this lecture we would be discussing now the discovery of water then the structure for water, physical properties, the biological significance of water and then we will be discussing the chemical properties. So this is something that is going to be very important for all of us to understand. So please do not miss this lecture. One by one, we will be discussing things, the things you already know related to water, we will be covering them fast. The things you have to pay more attention, we will be focusing and uh, focusing on that and putting more time on that right so let us start with the discovery of water so as far as the discovery of water is concerned it was henry cavendish who in the year 1781 obtained water by burning of hydrogen so this is something that we've already discussed while we were studying the discovery of hydrogen henry cavendish was the one who studied the properties of hydrogen and he found out that when hydrogen is going to burn in air it is going to result in the production of water h2 plus o2 is going to form h2o now uh, after that it was levasseur again in the year 1791 he confirmed the compound nature of water he said that yes water is uh, not an element because till now it was considered that water is an element but he confirmed that it is not an element but it is a compound which is made up of two elements that is hydrogen and oxygen dumas in 1842 he established that water contains h2 and o2 in the ratio of 1 is to 8 by weight so we all now know that oxygen has the atomic mass of 16 amu hydrogen has the atomic mass of 1 amu so 1 amu plus 1 amu is going to be 2 amu 2 is to 16 is going to be 1 is to 8 by weight so these are as far as the discovery related to water they are concerned so next we discuss the structure of water and uh, well in the structure of water I have nothing much to tell you about this is going to be essentially a revision of what you have all studied while you were studying the course on chemical bonding. Now uh, when we will be discussing this all in fact revising all this so we will be discussing it in three parts. First we will be discussing the structure of water in the gaseous state 
then in the liquid state and then in the solid state so when we have the gaseous state you all know that the molecules they are far away from each other far away from the intermolecular forces of attraction so they are going to exist as individual molecules and when we have a molecule of water how is it formed i hope you all know to draw the lewis structure that is the that is something that we started our chemical bonding discussion with drawing the lewis structures so as far as the lewis structure for water is concerned oxygen in the center which has six low, uh, valence electrons and hydrogen this has one valence electron all trying to attain the nearest noble gas configuration so oxygen is going to form two covalent bonds with hydrogen right so as a result what we will be seeing is that oxygen is going to have two bonded pair of electrons with hydrogen and they are going to be present two lone pair of electrons now this is going to be an sp3 hybridization just like the methane molecule but here in methane we have all covalent bonds being formed by carbon and therefore it is going to be a tetrahedral geometry and all bond angles they are equal they have a value of 109.5 degrees but in case of water molecule this is going to be a distorted tetrahedral geometry because two of the positions they are occupied by lone pairs and what do the lone pairs do well they are regions of high electron density so there is going to be a maximum repulsion between them they will move away from each other when they will be moving away from each other they will be coming closer to the bond <clears throat> bonded pair of electrons right so this is going to move away from each other they will be coming close and they are also going to be repelling each other in such a way that these two bonded pair of electrons which are going to have the minimum repulsion they will come more close to another so as a result what we have is that the two uh bonds they are having an angle of 104.5 degree in comparison to methane where the angle is 109.5 degrees and therefore the shape of this molecule is going to be a bent or a v shape and the bond angle oxygen hydrogen bond this is 95.7 picometer now there is something more over here and that is in relation to the electronegativity values of oxygen and hydrogen so the electronegativity value of oxygen is 3.5 this is just next to fluorine second highest electronegativity value after fluorine we have it for oxygen and the electronegativity value of hydrogen is 2.1 so therefore the bond which is going to be formed between oxygen and hydrogen due to this large electronegativity difference what is going to happen the bonded pair of electron uh, the bonded pair of electron this is going to shift towards oxygen there is going to be a partial negative charge on oxygen a partial positive charge on hydrogen similarly on the other side also and as the molecule is electrically neutral so there is going to be a partial positive charge on each of the hydrogens and to balance it out there is going to be a two negative partial uh, two negative partial charge on oxygen right and as a result of this polarity of the molecule uh, polarity of the bond and the bent shape so what we will be having is that the individual bond moments they will not be cancelling out each other as it would be have if we would have this as a linear molecule right so in the linear molecule the dipoles they cancel out but it is a bent shape so the dipole moments of the individual bonds they will not be cancelling out and we have the dipole moment value for water to be 1.84 dibai right so i hope this is all clear to you that this is as far as the gaseous form is concerned we have the lowest structure like this the lone pair of electrons they are going to be present they are going to be two in number as a result of the repulsions we will be having the shape of the molecule to be a bent shape uh, in comparison to the methane molecule the value of the bond angle this is going to decrease it will be 104.5 degrees this is a tetra distorted tetrahedral geometry the dipole moment values so this and the hybridization this is sp3 hybridization just like methane so these are as far as the gaseous form they are concerned let us now discuss what is going to happen in the liquid form 
Now moving on from the gaseous form to the liquid state, what is going to be changing in case of water is that the molecules, they are going to come closer to one another. When they are going to come closer to one another, they are going to experience intermolecular forces of attraction. Intermolecular forces of attraction is one thing that we discussed in detail while we were talking about the course on states of matter. And one very special intermolecular force of attraction is hydrogen bonding. So what we see is that the water molecules in the liquid state, they have hydrogen bonds between the water molecule. Now, why is this so? I hope you all remember what is a hydrogen bond. So we have one molecule. In this molecule, we have hydrogen, which is attached to an electronegative element by a covalent bond. So we have already discussed that there is an electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen. Due to this, the bond is polar. Oxygen, this has a partial negative charge. Hydrogen will be having a partial positive charge. Now, this partial positive charge on hydrogen means that this hydrogen is electron deficient and it wants to complete the deficiency of its. So it is going to get attracted towards even other molecules which are going to have electron rich atoms, right? So the other water molecule, now this is also having an oxygen which is electron rich. It has lone pair of electrons. So there are going to be regions of high electron density for this oxygen, right? So we see is that oxygen, the criteria for hydrogen bonding is for the other molecule, the oxygen atom. This is a small sized atom with having high electronegativity value and lone pair of electrons. That means regions of high electron density. So there is going to be a partial negative charge on this oxygen, a partial positive charge on this hydrogen, and they are going to get attracted towards each other. And this force of attraction is what we refer to as hydrogen bonds. The detailed lecture is also available in the course on states of matter. So if you have any doubts, you can just go back and revise your concepts. So now a hydrogen bond is formed. This is not going to be as strong as the covalent bond, but it is far more stronger than the other intermolecular forces of attraction. So this keeps the water molecules they quite close to, any, to each other. They get associated with each other. Now, because of this hydrogen bonding, we see that water is bestowed with very special properties, which we will be discussing very shortly while we will be discussing the properties of water, right? Now, one more thing which you have to remember is that in the uh, water molecule, each oxygen atom, this has the capability of forming two hydrogen bonds in the liquid state. OK, it is a possibility that this oxygen may be combining with two hydrogens of the other molecule. It is also possible that it may attach by a hydrogen bond with one molecule and the other hydrogen bond with, with another molecule, which means that now if you are seeing over here that this oxygen is getting attached by hydrogen bonds to only one molecule, but it is a possibility that it can attach to two molecules because it can form two hydrogen bonds. It can be with the same uh, molecule hydrogens or it can be with the different hydrogens of the two different molecules, right? Uh, so this is as far as the liquid state is concerned. Now let us look at the solid state of water and the solid state of water is known as, yes, it is known as ice. So let us look at the structure of ice. What happens in ice is, let us look at one molecule. Okay, one molecule of water oxygen is going to be in the center. It is going to be forming two covalent bonds with two hydrogen atoms and uh, hydrogen is going to get a partial positive charge. Oxygen is going to get a partial negative charge and because of this partial negative charge on this oxygen, it is going to get attracted to the hydrogens of the other molecules by hydrogen bonds. So this is happening in the liquid state. This is also happening in the solid state. Now what happens in the solid state is that each ox, each water molecule, this is going to be tetrahedrally surrounded by four other water molecules. Okay, let us look at this. You can see this oxygen over here this oxygen forming a covalent bond and then this is forming a bond with hydrogen bond with the other molecule. So this is one 
you can just see the oxygens it would be better understanding so this oxygen is surrounded by one oxygen this direction one oxygen this direction one with this and one with this so it is going to be tetrahedral arrangement in which one oxygen atom is going to be surrounded by four other oxygen atoms and in between there are going to be hydrogen atoms right or you can say one molecule of water is tetrahedrally surrounded by four other water molecules now each hydrogen you can see over here this is going to be uh, bonded to one oxygen by a covalent bond and one oxygen by a hydrogen bond and when such a structure is getting formed in which each water molecule is surrounded tetrahedrally by four other water molecules the arrangement that comes is looking like a hexagon right so you can see this is a hexagonal structure in which now they are going to large empty spaces and this hexagonal structure can also be called as a open cage like structure it is looking like a cage when the temperature gets reduced to quite a lower level please do remember this hexagonal structure even changes to a cubical structure but when we are just generally talking about the structure of ice we are saying that this is a hexagonal structure open cage like structure with large empty spaces and these large empty spaces they have lot of significance which you will just now understand all right so i hope this structure first of all this is clear to you that we have one water molecule in one water molecule there are going to be oxygen in the center surrounded by two hydrogen with covalent bonds and this oxygen can form two hydrogen bonds so in total it is forming four bonds with hydrogen two covalent and two hydrogen bonds perfectly fine and each hydrogen this is forming two bonds again one it is going to be a covalent bond and one is going to be a hydrogen bond each oxygen you can say it is going to be tetrahedrally surrounded by four other oxygen atoms with in between a hydrogen or one water molecule tetrahedrally surrounded by four other water molecules now let us compare water in the liquid state and water in the solid state do you see what is the difference in structure okay first of all let us talk about the similarity the similarity is again as we see for the solid state even in the liquid state each oxygen atom this is forming two covalent bonds two hydrogen bonds each hydrogen atom is forming one covalent bond one hydrogen and each oxygen you can see this is being surrounded by four water molecules in the liquid state as well but the difference that comes over here is that these water molecules they are not arranged around one water molecule in some orderly fashion here it is a much ordered arrangement in the solid state whereas in the liquid state this arrangement is not ordered and in fact what we notice is that one water molecule will not be surrounded always by four water molecules why is it so is because in the liquid state the thermal motion or the kinetic energy of the molecules is going to be more and hence every time we will not be having molecules where there is going to be one molecule surrounded by four water molecules but in the solid state the thermal motion of the molecules is less the molecules they are uh, much arranged into this open cage like structure right so i hope this is clear so what we have is that both ice and water they have hydrogen bonding but because of the open cage like structure in ice so ice is going to occupy more volume and when it is going to occupy more volume the density of ice is going to be less than that of water and this is something which is asked in the examination as a subjective question also so i'm going to discuss a few questions which are generally Uh, asked in relation to the structure of ice and water so here are a few questions regarding density of ice and water density of water and ice is something that we should be actually discussing when we start with the discussion on the physical properties of water because it is going to be a physical property but when we discuss the structure in the gaseous state the liquid state the solid state this is the most appropriate position where you can understand things better so rather than just following conventional ways i am just moving out of it we will be discussing the density over here and then we will be discussing the rest of the physical properties so the first question over here that you should understand is why density of ice is less than that of water 
So just now we have studied the structure for water in the liquid state as well as in the solid state. Right. And there I told you that density of ice is going to be less than that of water because it has an open cage like structure. Now, what is making density less now? That is something that you should understand. Most of you will probably can understand only and visualize things, but for those who do not, and if you have to write a subjective examination, then you should be able to put it into words as well. We here at H2O Chemistry, we are trying to prepare you for any type of examination, be it a subjective examination or a competitive one. So why density of ice is less than that of water? We know all that density is mass upon unit volume. So uh, this means that if the volume is going to increase, the density is going to decrease. And we know that water is going to expand on freezing. Why it is expanding on freezing? Because when ice is being formed, there are empty spaces coming up in between. In water, the molecules, they are going to be closer together. Whereas in ice, they are going to go far away from each other to form that cage-like structure. So what we have is that the volume of ice for the same mass of water, this is going to be greater than that of liquid water. And if the volume has increased, obviously density being inversely proportional, that is going to decrease. And hence we will have density of ice to be lower than that of liquid water. And it is because of this reason that ice is going to float on water. Fine. As you must have seen also in many of the pictures, if not actually, that we have big, big icebergs which are floating on water. And it is this is because the ice is uh, less dense than water that they are able to float on water. So uh, over here, one thing which you should remember is the value of the density of ice and that of water. Density of ice is going to be 0 0.934 gram per centimeter cube, whereas that of water is 1 gram per centimeter cube at 277 Kelvin. Now this temperature over here, 200 77 Kelvin. This is going to be 4 degrees Celsius. This is very important. Fine. Why it is important is something that I'm going to talk about on the next question. So the next question is water has maximum density at 277 Kelvin or 4 degrees Celsius. Why? Uh, now what this means is that we just now studied that at 4 degrees Celsius, the density of water is 1 gram per centimeter cube. If the temperature is going to be less than that or greater than that, the density of water is going to decrease. Uh, why it is going to decrease is something that we should now understand. So just now what we have studied is that ice has density less than that of water. So this means is below the melting point of water, that is 0 degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin, we will have only ice. So we will have always density of ice to be less than that of water. Now the question becomes that from 0 to 4 degrees Celsius, why is the density less? Because from 0 to 4 degrees Celsius also we are having liquid water and beyond 4 degrees Celsius also we are having liquid water. So what is happening that the density is maximum at 4 degrees Celsius. So here what you have to remember is that when we have ice and we start melting it, right? So it is going to be a temperature above 273 Kelvin or 0 degrees Celsius. So ice is melting, ice is melting. This means that the hydrogen bonds which were responsible for the cage like structure of ice now they are breaking when they will break water will be formed what will happen the empty spaces they were present in ice they are no longer there so that means the volume will start decreasing volume of ice is greater than that of water so volume has started decreasing and as volume is inversely proportional to density the density is going to increase so it is experimentally formed that up till 4 degrees Celsius, this density will keep on increasing. Okay. So now the question becomes that what happens after 4 degrees Celsius that again the density starts decreasing. So what happens is that when we move to a temperature higher than 4 degrees Celsius or 277 Kelvin, the motion of the particles, the water molecules, they are getting heated up. So there is going to be increased thermal motion now. 
right rather than the breaking of the bonds what is going to dominate now is the thermal motion of the molecules so there is going to be uh, the molecules moving farther away from each other right so the kinetic energy is going to increase and hence when the molecules they are moving away from each other there is going to be an increase in volume an increase in volume is going to mean that the density will start decreasing so from 0 to 4 degree celsius the hydrogen bonds they are breaking that is why the volume is uh, decreasing and the density is increasing and beyond 4 degree celsius the thermal motion of the molecules is increasing the molecules they are moving farther away from each other and hence the volume starts increasing and the density starts decreasing right so i hope this is clear that water has maximum density at 4 degree celsius or 277 kelvin now the next question is why the lakes they freeze from top towards bottom and you may not have seen actually this happening but well you may have seen it in the movies there is a boy and a girl who are running on the surface of ice the ice develops a crack below that there is water the girl falls into the water and the boy heroically comes and saves her and brings her out of top of that frozen water right so now this is something that you have seen it in the movies at least and you do understand that it is the surface of the lake that has frozen and below that there is water so now being stein students you should be able to give an explanation why it is happening so so let us understand why it is happening so what happens is that during the winters the temperature is going to fall to quite low a temperature so when the temperature is falling down the temperature of the water of the lake is also going to decrease right now when the temperature is decreasing it will be first of all the temperature of the topmost layers that will decrease because they are directly in contact with the atmosphere right so the cold water on the surface this is going to become heavier it will sink down towards the bottom of the lake because something that is cold that sinks down and something that is uh, hot it rises up right so the warm water now from the bottom this will move upwards towards the surface and this process will keep on going on the cold water coming down the hot water going up till the temperature of the entire lake becomes 277 kelvin that is 4 degree celsius because here now the density of water is going to be maximum now beyond that even if the temperature still keeps on decreasing then what will happen then well we have the maximum density so if the temperature is going to be now falling up to say 3 degree celsius or 2 degree celsius so it is going to be a less of a density now right so when it is less density so it has to remain on top so what will happen is that any further decrease in temperature on surface water this will result in the decrease in density and so the temperature of the surface water will decrease first and ultimately this will freeze it will not go down now because it is lighter than the water below it so the temperature of the water underneath the surface this will remain at 277 kelvin any further decrease in temperature causes the water in contact with the ice on the surface to freeze so first a layer on the surface has frozen then the layer next to it that will freeze then the layer next to it that will freeze and if the temperature gets on getting cold and cold and cold this freezing will continue as a result the lake will keep on freezing but it will be from top to bottom it will not be starting from bottom to top right so this is the phenomenon now which enables the aquatic life to survive during the winter months so below the layers we have water the aquatic life is living into it and over that there is ice present and in fact that ice acts as an insulator also from the outer atmospheric cold right so this is going to be something that is going to be very helpful to the aquatic life to survive during the winter months so this is also one question which can be asked to you in the examination and all this is related to the density of water and ice 
So next we talk about the properties of water where first of all we will be discussing the physical properties and amongst these one property which we have already discussed is related to the density of water. So moving on further let us learn a few more properties and the first one is that water is a colorless, tasteless and odorless liquid. It has no color, it has no taste, it has no smell. Well, many of you now ask a question that when we are drinking water at our place, it stays differently when we go to some other place. How can you say that water is tasteless? So here what you have to remember is that the taste of water that you are perceiving is because of the salts which are present in water. And from one place to another, the nature of these salts, the proportion of these salts present in water that may vary and therefore we have different tastes of water. In its purest form, for example, when we taste distilled water, right? So that is the purest form of water we have. You will see that it has no taste. Similarly, another question which is asked by the students is that if water is colorless, how do the seas and oceans, they have blue color? So here what you have to remember is that if you have a handful of water, it is going to be colorless. If you have a bucket full of water, it is colorless. But when water is going to be present in thick layers as in seas and oceans, it gives a bluish tinge in these thick layers. And hence, we have the seas and oceans to be looking blue in color. Next, what you have to remember is that when we are going to compare water, which is a hydride of oxygen, to the hydrides of other elements of the oxygen family, water is going to have abnormally high freezing point, boiling point, heat of vaporization, heat of fusion. Okay. So, if you compare, for example, the boiling points, let us talk about the boiling point. The boiling point of water is 373 Kelvin, that is 100 degrees Celsius. If you compare it to H2S, the boiling point is going to be 213 Kelvin. For H2SE, that is selenium hydride, it is going to be 232 Kelvin. And for tellurium hydride, it is 269 Kelvin. So what we see is in general as we are going to move down the group the boiling point of the hydrides they are going to increase but water this has abnormally higher boiling point than all of these hydrides. So why is it so? It is going to be true for all of these properties and this is because of the polar nature of water and the presence of the intermolecular hydrogen bonding. So when boiling has to occur, we have to change a liquid into a solid, uh, sorry, into a gas. So here we have to overcome the intermolecular forces of attraction. And because in the water as a liquid, there are hydrogen bonds present. So there we will be requiring much more energy to convert the liquid into the so, uh, gaseous state. Right. In comparison to the other hydrides, those hydrides like we have H2S, they will not be having hydrogen bonds present among the various molecules and hence the intermolecular forces of attraction, they are less and hence we will be requiring lesser energy to overcome those intermolecular forces of attraction. Therefore, uh, these hydrides, they will be having lesser uh, values of the freezing points, the boiling points, heat of vaporization as well as heat of fusion. Fine. Although we will be discussing more of this when we will be uh, talking about the oxygen family when we will be taking up this course in class 12th, okay, in the P-block elements. So water also, please do remember this has high specific heat capacity, surface tension, thermal conductivity, dipole moment and dielectric constant values much higher than the most of the liquids and the reason is again the same water this has a polar nature and because of hydrogen bonding so all these uh, properties values they are going to be much higher for water than most of the liquids now the rest of the terms i hope you all understand because you have studied them in the course on chemical bonding states of matter uh, thermodynamics along with this you have studied them in physics as well so i will not be elaborating more on them but one thing that i want you uh, to understand is dielectric constant so the dielectric constant value for water this is high the value is 80 and what this means is that water this has a strong tendency to reduce the force of attraction between the ions of an ionic compound 
Now, what I mean by this? Well, this is quite confusing. No, it is not. Uh, you have studied about hydration energy when we were talking about chemical bonding. I hope you all remember. So, we have an ionic compound, sodium chloride, in which there are sodium ions and there are chloride ions. When you are going to put this into water, what is going to happen? Water is a polar molecule. So, there is going to be a partial negative charge on oxygen, a partial positive charge on hydrogen. So, this partially negative oxygen is going to get attracted towards the sodium ions and similarly the chloride ions they will be getting attracted to the partial positive charge ox uh, hydrogen of the water molecule right so in this way the sodium ion is getting attracted towards the oxygen and chloride ions are attracting towards hydrogen and as a result they are going to get pulled apart from each other and what we will be getting is sodium ions separate and chloride ions separate right so they are moved away from each other we will be getting a solution now in which there will be sodium ions there will be chloride ions and hence we can say that the ionic compound this has dissolved in water and because water has a high dielectric constant so it can easily dissolve the ionic compounds it can easily separate the ionic bond between the ions present in that ionic compound fine so what do we have uh, just let me put this into writing so that you can remember this as well so dielectric constant of water this is high and it is high because of the polar nature of the water molecules this is significant as the ionic compounds that tend to dissociate in water yielding solutions containing ions because of the high value of the dielectric constant okay i hope this is clear to you so now as a result of this discussion you can understand that water this acts as a universal solvent water can dissolve more substances than any other liquid because water can dissolve ionic compounds due to the polar nature of the water molecules right because of the high dielectric constant value it can also dissolve many of the covalent compounds like alcohols and carbohydrates because here it is capable of forming hydrogen bonds with the alcohols as well as the carbohydrates right so we will be having in alcohols and carbohydrates the oh group in that oh group again we have a hydrogen which is covalently bonded to an electronegative atom so that hydrogen this can form a covalent bond uh, sorry a hydrogen bond with the oxygen of the water molecule so we have the alcohols and carbohydrates dissolving in water because of the virtue of uh, the polar nature of the water molecules and we have the dissolving of ionic compounds by the virtue of high dielectric constant of water and hence we can say that water this acts as a universal solvent so now let us discuss the biological significance of water here only because this is going to be in relation to all the things that we've just now studied so the first we have is the high heat of vaporization and high heat capacity of water they are responsible for the moderation of climate so what this means is when the high heat of vaporization water is going to require much more energy to change into water vapors and similarly if we have to raise the temperature of water by 1 degree celsius we will be requiring more heat for water so this uh, in relation to land when we are going to compare the cooling and heating up of land in comparison to water what we will be seeing is the land will get cooled faster than water it will get heated up what uh, faster than water and as a result of this we will be seeing sea breezes and land breezes and these are responsible for the moderation of climate fine the next we have is uh, that water this is a universal solvent so we've just now studied and most of the plant body and the human body the animal body this is composed of water 65% of the human body is composed of uh, water and for the plants that it can even go up to 90% water so water being a universal solvent for ionic compounds as well as for many covalent compounds this is going to be an excellent solvent for the transportation of ions and molecules required for plant and animal metabolism just now we discussed that because of the virtue of hydrogen bonding with polar molecules uh, like uh, alcohol carbohydrates they get dissolved in water and this is going to play a very important role in carbohydrate metabolism 
Next also we have discussed that the density of ice is more than that of water. So ice is flows on water. This provides an insulation to the water in the lakes in winters and ensures survival of aquatic life. So this is something that we've already discussed in detail. So I do not need to elaborate more. So last we move on to the final discussion for today and that is going to be on the chemical properties of water and the first property is that water is neutral in nature. It is neither acidic nor basic and the pH of pure water is 7. So based on this we have the electrical conductivity of water. Water is a weak electrolyte. It feebly ionizes into H ions and OH ions. Now the moment you have written H ions I hope you remember that the H ion is nothing but a proton and this is too small to have an independent existence of its own. Therefore it is going to combine with one more water molecule to form the hydronium ion. So you can write this reaction also as 2H2O being equal to uh, H3O positive and OH positive. The next we have the ionic product of water which is Kw. This has the value of 1 into 10 power minus 14 mole to mole, uh, liter minus 2 at 295 Kelvin. That is 25 degrees Celsius and this also shows that water this has a small conductivity. Now here again you can revise the concepts that you learned for the preparation of hydrogen. What we learned was that we can prepare hydrogen by the electrolysis of water. But we also learned there that we do not do the electrolysis of pure water. Why we do not do the electrolysis of pure water? Because it has a poor conductivity. Why it has a poor conductivity? Because it is feebly ionizing into H ions and OH ions. And for that we used to add an acid or a base. So that the, uh, the ionization into H ions and OH ions this improves and hence the water this becomes conducting in nature. Right. So keep on revising the concepts that you have already learned along with learning of the new ones so that the previous ones they get revised and the new one learning this becomes easy. Next we have is the emphoteric nature of water. Now emphoteric is again something that we learned while we were talking about hydrogen. So what is an emphoteric element is what you learn uh, while the preparation of hydrogen and emphoteric element was one which could act uh, react with both acid as well as a base and for that we did the reaction of zinc with H2SO4 and with zinc with NaOH in the process hydrogen was getting evolved. So here now we have the emphoteric nature of water which is also going to mean the same thing that water this can act as a acid as well as a base fine so let us see the reactions now where water is acting as an acid as well as a base so water when this is going to react with hcl so hcl is a strong acid so this is going to be the acid and therefore water will be acting as the base hcl is going to lose a h positive ion and water is going to gain that h positive ion so hcl this is acid this is forming chloride ions. So this is going to be the conjugate base of HCl. And water, this is going to uh, take up that H positive ion because it is taking up that H positive ion. So this is acting as a base. And the conjugate acid of water is going to be the hydronium ion. So this is the reaction where water is acting as a base. Right? So water will act as a base when there are going to be substances which are stronger acids than itself. Next let us see where it is acting as a acid. So ammonia now this is going to be a stronger base than water. Fine. So water now this will act as an acid. It will lose the H positive ion which will be gained by the ammonia molecule. So water when this is going to lose H positive it will be forming OH ions which is going to be its conjugate base and ammonia will be gaining that H positive ion. So this is going to act as a base and NH4 positive the ammonium ions this will be acting as the conjugate acid for the base ammonia. So again now you can see that water is now acting as an acid towards bases which are stronger than itself. So this shows the emphoteric nature of water. Water, this can act as a base. Water, it can act as an acid. Next property of water is the self-ionization of water, which we refer to as autoprotolysis. Now, what do we mean by this? Last slide, you saw this reaction. 
right so the reaction was that water this get ionizes into h ions and oh ions the h ion this does not have an independent existence it combines with another water molecule to form the hydronium ion h3o positive and oh negative so this is the way we wrote this reaction now i'm going to just rewrite this reaction and the rewritten reaction is that rather than writing the two water molecules together i have written them separately so it does not make a difference i hope okay now i am just going to speak this reaction in another way the reaction is that the two water molecules they are reacting with one another to form h3o positive and oh negative this is the way when we write the reaction we speak them out right so water this reacts with the hcl molecule to form this and this so here one water molecule is reacting with the other water molecule to form h3o positive and oh negative so what has happened in this reaction one of the water molecules let us say this one this is losing a proton and forming oh negative and the other one this is gaining that proton and forming h3o positive so the first water molecule this is acting as a acid because this is lost a proton and this one this is acting as a base because this is gaining the proton and on the other side the h3o positive this is the one which has gained that proton so this is the conjugate acid of this base whereas oh negative is going to be the conjugate base of this water molecule so this is the cell finalization of water the water molecules they have broken them each other into ions right so this is cell finalization we call this as auto protolysis also from one water molecule a proton has been broken lysis means broken and that of a proton by itself right so one of the molecules causing the other to break its proton so this is auto protolysis i hope this is clear to you now now the next property of water is the redox reaction that water shows let us see a few examples where water is going to act as an oxidizing agent or reducing agent so the first example we have is the reaction which are of water with metals so here what we see is that water this reacts with active metals liberating hydrogen gas and thus it acts as an oxidizing agent and this is again the reactions that we have studied while we were doing the preparation of hydrogen so for example we have the reaction of water with sodium metal right so sodium metal this reacts with water to form naoh and hydrogen is evolved what is happening in this reaction so if we write down the oxidation state for all of these you will get the sodium in the elemental form this will have an oxidation state of 0 in water the oxidation state of hydrogen will be plus 1 oxygen will be minus 2 moving on to naoh sodium is going to have a oxidation state of plus 1 oxygen will be again minus 2 and hydrogen will be plus 1 so the oh ion is as a whole hoh negative right so here there is going to be no oxidation state change for this oxygen and hydrogen but for this hydrogen molecule the oxidation state of hydrogen is going to be zero so sodium's oxidation state has increased from 0 to plus 1 so what this means is that sodium is getting oxidized okay and what is causing that oxidation it is hydrogen which is causing that oxidization so uh, we have hydrogen to be the oxidizing agent in this reaction also you can see the oxidation state of hydrogen getting reduced from plus 1 to 0 so what is happening to uh, hydrogen over here hydrogen is getting reduced so the substance which gets reduced this acts as an oxidizing agent fine i hope this is clear that the in the reaction of water with metals uh, hydro <clears throat> water is acting as an oxidizing agent you can see another reaction of calcium with water forming calcium hydroxide and hydrogen again here water is going to act as an oxidizing agent now let us look at the reaction of water with non metals so here please to remember that water this is going to act as a reducing agent when it is going to react with active non metals like fluorine or chlorine let us look at the reaction with fluorine so fluorine on reaction with water this is going to form h ions and f ions in the aqueous solution and oxygen is going to be evolved so here now if we look at the oxidation number for fluorine in the elemental form the oxidation number is going to be 
and in F negative it is minus 1. So this is a decrease in the oxidation number. So this is going to be a reduction reaction, right? So fluorine to F negative, this is a reduction reaction. And for this water is going to act as the reducing agent. And if we look at water to oxygen now, right? So water to oxygen, oxygen, this has a oxidation number of minus 2. And here oxygen, now this is in the elemental form, so it is 0. So minus 2 to 0 is what we are getting for oxygen over here. So this is an increase in oxidation number. So this is a oxidation reaction. And here fluorine, this will be acting as the oxidizing agent, right? So we have uh, just a moment. Yeah. So we have fluorine to be the oxidant or the oxidizing agent and water to be acting as the reducing agent or reductant in this reaction. Right. The next we have is a reaction of uh, carbon or uh, with water and here this reaction if you just remember looking at the reaction you will realize that this is the reaction of red hot coke with steam to form carbon monoxide and hydrogen mixture which we know as water gas. So this is again something that we learned while we studied the Bosch process the industrial preparation of hydrogen. So here in this reaction what you will be seeing is that now the carbon this has an oxidation number of 0 in the elemental form. Here it is going to be plus 2. Right. So this is an increase in oxidation number. So here carbon this is getting oxidized to carbon monoxide. So this is oxidation reaction and here water this will be acting as the oxidizing agent now. I hope now this is clear that water this is acting as an oxidizing agent in some reactions that is acting as a reducing agent in some reactions. Now one more reaction we will be doing which is going to be very important redox reaction for water and that is going to be the photosynthesis reaction. So let us now discuss the reactions which are involved in photosynthesis. I hope I do not have to tell you what photosynthesis is because this is something that you have been studying from your junior classes. The mechanism by which the plants utilizing chlorophyll present in the green leaves, they are making their own food. So here we are going to see there are going to be two major steps involved in photosynthesis. First step is the oxidation of oxygen in the water molecule in the presence of light. So the reaction is water forming oxygen oxygen and H negative ion. So here oxygen, this has the oxidation state of minus 2 from 2, two going up to 0. So minus 2 to 0 increase in oxidation number. So this is an oxidation reaction. The next step is the reduction step where hydrogen ions, they reduce carbon in the carbon dioxide and we get carbohydrates. Right. So if we write the net reaction, we will be getting carbon dioxide plus 2H2O forming CH2O which is an empirical formula for a carbohydrate plus water plus oxygen or if we write it in the form of the carbohydrate as glucose, so it is going to be C6H12O6 and the complete reaction now this would become 6 carbon dioxide plus 12 water forming glucose C6H12O6 plus 6 water and 6 O2. So this is the redox reactions for photosynthesis, oxidation reactions, reduction reactions taking place in the process. The next category of reaction water shows they are called as the hydrolysis reaction. Now first of all let us understand what does the word hydrolysis means. Hydro is going to refer to the Greek word water and lysis is going to act, uh, refer to the Greek word unwind. So what this in simple terms mean is that we are going to use water for causing the unwinding or the breaking of the bonds of other chemical substances. So water is going to react with other chemical substances and cause the breakdown of the bonds in that. Right. So the first example of these hydrolysis reactions are when water is going to combine with non-metallic oxides to form acids. 
For example, reaction of carbon dioxide with water is going to form carbonic acid H2CO3. Sulfur dioxide is going to combine with water to form H2SO3 that is sulfurous acid. Sulfur, di sulfur trioxide will react with water to form H2SO4 that is sulfuric acid. P2O5 reacts with water to form H3PO4 which is orthophosphoric acid. The other way you can write this reaction is P4O10 combining with 6 water molecules to form 4H3PO4. This is the way the reaction is written in the NCRT textbook. Now N2 O5, this will react with water to form HNO3, which is known as nitric acid, and Cl2O7, this reacts with water to form HClO4, which is perchloric acid. So, these are as far as the uh, reactions of water is concerned with the non metallic oxides. And therefore, these are also called as acidic oxides because when the non metallic oxides they are going to combine with water, they are going to form the corresponding acids. Now, another uh, thing which I can tell you over here is how to remember an as acid and an ic acid. So, what you do is just check the oxidation states. For hydrogen and oxygen, the oxidation state will remain the same. For hydrogen, it will be plus 1. For oxygen, it will be minus 2. So, the oxidation state is going to different for sulfur. So, here the sulfur oxidation state will be plus 4. In sulfuric acid, it will be plus 6. So, wherever the oxidation number is more, that will be the ic acid and where the oxidation number will be less, that is going to be the us acid. Okay. So, this is uh, when we uh, you are going to remember H2SO3 and H2SO4. Similarly, you can remember this HNO3 and HNO2 also. HNO3 will be nitric acid and HNO2 will be nitrous acid. Okay. So, this is how we remember these things. So, let us see a few more examples of the hydrolysis reactions and the reaction of water with the metallic oxides. So, when water is going to react with metallic oxides, it is going to form the corresponding alkali and that is why we refer to the metallic oxides as basic oxides. For example, when sodium Oxide, this is going to react with water, this is going to form NaOH. Calcium oxide, then this will react with water, this will form calcium hydroxide. The next we have some more hydrolysis reactions where we can see silicon tetrachloride, SiCl4, reacting with water to form SiO2 plus HCl. AlCl3 reacting with water to form aluminium hydroxide plus HCl. Sodium carbonate reacting with water to form NaOH and H2CO3. Now, there is a question which is frequently asked in the examination that the aqueous solution of aluminium chloride, this is acidic in nature, whereas the aqueous solution of sodium carbonate, this is basic in nature. Can you explain why? So, here when you look at this reaction, what you can see is that the hydrolysis of aluminium chloride, firstly, this will be producing aluminium oxide which on further reaction with water will produce aluminium hydroxide. Aluminium hydroxide is a weak base but along with this weak base we form HCl which is a strong acid. So as a result of a weak base and a strong acid we will be getting the aqueous solution of aluminium chloride to be acidic in nature. But when you will look at the reaction of sodium carbonate with water, you are going to get what? You will be getting a strong base that is NaOH and a weak acid that is carbonic acid. So, the aqueous solution of sodium carbonate is alkaline in nature. So, I hope you will be able to answer why the aqueous solution of aluminium chloride, this is acidic in nature, whereas that of sodium carbonate, this is basic or alkaline in nature. Let us see some more hydrolysis reaction now, the action of water on hydrides, carbides, nitrides and phosphides. So, you have seen already the reaction of hydrides with water while we were doing the preparation of hydrogen. So, you have seen calcium hydride react with water to form calcium hydroxide and hydrogen. I hope you all remember this we refer to as hydrolith. So, we did the reaction of lithium hydride with water, calcium hydride with water, sodium hydride with water. So, the hydrides when they will be reacting with water, they will be forming the corresponding hydroxide and hydrogen will be evolved. 
So here this is again a hydrolysis reaction. Similar reactions you will be seeing with carbides, nitrides and phosphides. For example, when calcium carbide, this is going to react with water. Again, the corresponding hydroxide will be formed and along with that you will be getting C2H2 that is acetylene or ethyne. Aluminium carbide on reaction with water. Again, this will be forming the corresponding hydroxide. This is aluminium hydroxide. Along with this, you will be getting methane. Magnesium nitride, this on reaction with water, this forms magnesium hydroxide and ammonia. Calcium phosphide on reaction with water, this is forming calcium hydroxide and phosphine. So what are you seeing over here? What you can see is that all these hydrides, carbide, nitrides, phosphides, they are ending first of all in ides. So when they are ending in I, these are binary compounds. When they are going to be binary compounds, they will be two element compounds. Okay. So when it is a hydride, it is the metal and hydrogen. When it is a carbide, it is the metal and carbon. When it is a nitride, it is a metal and a nitrogen. When it is a phosphide, it is a metal and phosphorus. So all these, they are binary compounds. And all these binary compounds, they are reacting with water to form the corresponding hydroxide. And along with that, what they will be forming is the corresponding uh, compound of these non-metals with hydrogen. So, right. So, this over here, calcium carbide, this is forming acetylene. In aluminium carbide, well, this is um, forming methane. So, this is something that you will have to remember. Nitride is forming ammonia and phosphide, this is forming PH3. So, this is something, a similar pattern. So, this is how you can remember these reactions. The next and the last property that water is going to show is going to be the hydration reactions or the hydrate formation reactions. Now these reactions they are different from the hydrolysis reactions. In hydrolysis reactions water is going to cause the hydrolysis the breakdown of the other compound and forming a new compound. But here you will be saying that water this is not going to react with the chemical substance for you can see for example we have the example of copper sulfate. 5H2O. Here these water molecules they are not reacting with copper sulfate. They have just simply got associated with this copper sulfate molecule. What I mean is what uh, we are doing is supposedly we are making crystals of copper sulfate. When we will be making those crystals we will be taking a super saturated solution of uh, copper sulfate and then we will be crystallizing copper sulfate from that. In the process of crystallization, some of the water molecules, they get associated with each molecule. Okay, And this is what we refer to as water of crystallization. So this water, this is going to become an integral part of the crystal system. When you are going to touch it, you will not be able to feel that it is wet. When you are going to apply water on that crystal, a pressure on that crystal, that water is not going to come out. It is going to be a part of the crystal. So this is what we refer to as hydration reaction. Now when water is going to get associated with other, water, uh, with other chemical substances as water of crystallization, there are going to be three types of hydrate formation that we will be seeing. The first is what we refer to as coordinated water. Here the water molecules, they get coordinated to the metal in a complex ion. For example, you can see uh, nickel ions on reacting with six water molecules. This is going to form a coordinate bond with water. Okay, So this is something that you will be better able to understand when in class 12th you will be studying coordination chemistry. So I will not be elaborating much on this over here. The next we have is hydrogen bonded water. So in copper sulfate 5H2O what we see is that four water molecules they get bonded to a copper ion which is by coordinate bonds whereas the fifth water molecule this is hydrogen bonded to the sulfate ions. So these four water molecules, they are going to be coordinated water molecules to the copper ion. And the fifth one is called as hydrogen bonded water. 
The next we have is interstitial water. So interstitial is going to be in between spaces. So here the hydrates are going to be the ones in which water molecules they occupy empty spaces or voids in the crystal gases. For example, what we see is in the formation of barium chloride crystals, two water molecules they get associated with barium chloride. So this is as far as the hydrate formation this is concerned. So this is the end as far as the theory is concerned and now let us see a few lecture review questions. These are the questions which are from previous year examinations and CRT exemplar book so that you have an understanding what is generally asked in the examination what is going to be important for you people. So I hope you all will be able to answer them. You have understood the whole concept very well. So please do post in your answers in the comment section. So the first question is the high density of water as compared to ice this is due to H bonding interactions, dipole dipole interactions, dipole induced dipole interactions, induced dipole induced dipole interactions. This was asked for the All India PMT examination 1997. So here we are trying to put up questions from even past 25 year papers so that we do not miss any concept which has been important in any of the competitive examination. So the next question is the critical temperature of water. This is higher than that of oxygen because water molecule this has fewer electrons than oxygen two covalent bonds of attraction v-shaped dipole moment and this is a question which was asked for the iit examination 1997 which of the following properties of water is are not correct water is known to be a universal solvent hydrogen bonding is present to a large extent in liquid water there is no hydrogen bonding in the frozen state of water frozen water this is heavier than liquid water and this is a question from the ncrt exemplar book the next we have is which of the following statements about water is false a question which was asked for the j mains 2019 examination right so we have water which can act both as an acid as well as a base there is extensive intramolecular hydrogen bonding in the condensed phase ice formed by water as uh, by heavy water this sinks in normal water so this is something that you will be able to study while we will be doing the next lecture uh, but please do try the question water is oxide oxidized to oxygen during photosynthesis the hydride ion h negative this is a stronger base than the hydroxide ion that is oh negative which of the following reactions will occur if sodium hydride is dissolved in water so h ions reacting with water to form the hydronium ions H ions reacting with water to form OH ions and hydrogen being evolved. H ions plus water, no reaction occurring or none of this. And this was a question which was asked for the All India PMT examination 1997. One last question. When, as a, when a substance A, this reacts with water, it produces a combustible gas B and a solution of substance C in water. When another substance reacts with this solution C, it produces the same gas B on warming, but D can produce gas B on reaction with dilute H2SO4 at room temperature. A imparts a deep golden yellow color to a smokeless flame of Bunsen burner. A, B, C, D respectively are and the choices they are given to you. And this was asked for again the All India PMT examination 1998. So these are a few questions which I have for you. I hope you all will be able to answer them correctly. So I am just waiting for your answers. So that would be all for this lecture and in the next lecture we would be discussing about heavy water. Right. So please I hope you have enjoyed the lecture. So please do give it a thumbs up and if you've not subscribed to the channel please do that and also do click on the bell icon so that you get a notification the moment we put up the next lecture for you. See you again. Have a nice day. God bless you.